In this week's video, we'll review the latest charts and data to help us answer the question, which way is the tipping point market going to break? We've got a lot to cover, so feel free to use the pause button on your video player. Let's review the big picture during the session on Friday, November 10th. This is that all-important anchored volume weighted average price chart that we covered in last week's video. This is a daily chart on your screen. It's as of the close on November 9th, which was Thursday. Last week, price made a stand above the anchored volume weighted average price line tied to the 2022 low, the 2021 high, the COVID high, and the COVID low. You can see all of those lines intersect right in this area here, making it an extremely important institutional inflection point. If institutions are still confident about this rally, we would expect them to be net buyers in this area. If they had lost confidence in the rally, we would expect them to be net sellers, causing price to drop below all of the anchored volume weighted average price lines. That may happen, hasn't happened yet. What do these lines tell us? They tell us that the average buyer weighted by volume that bought at the COVID low at this point up here was basically at break even. And that's true for this high, this low, this high, and this low. When we pop back above the line on average, all of those buyers from all four of those major points are profitable on average making it easier to hold their positions from a risk management perspective and a psychological perspective. All of that flips if price drops and stays below the four colored lines. If we fast forward to Friday's session and look at weekly charts intraday. We've still got a weekly battle going on at 11.42 a.m. Eastern Time on Friday, November 10th, the weekly chart of the S&P 500 SPX here up 17 points for the week. We've been volatile. That could still go either way, but it's not likely that we're going to close below an upward sloping 200 week moving average in red. And the same can be said for the NASDAQ. 11.46 a.m. on Friday, November 10th, up 1.36% or 182 points for the week, and trading above an upward sloping 200 week moving average in red. Short to intermediate term, things still look good. Longer term, things still look good. Having said that, we're still near an important area, still near an important area, and still very, very close to an extremely important area. We'll continue to take it day by day. S&P Composite 1500 as of Thursday's close, also a daily chart. All of the concepts that we covered in the last chart apply to this chart at this point. Your average buyer weighted by volume is profitable from this point, this point, this point, and this point. And on this chart, there's a little bit more leeway because if we don't hold these lines, we've got these lines down here. You can see here, it's not unusual for price to undercut these lines for a short period of time and then hold. It happened here, here, and here. It was a weekly S&P 500 chart printed earlier this week. Even at that point, price above all of these anchored volume weighted average price lines, including those tied to these intermediate highs and these intermediate lows. It's much, much easier for market participants to be patient with a look like this relative to price getting into this area here. Since this chart was printed, Price has improved a little bit, roughly by 27 points as of 11.42 a.m. on Friday. Up 17 for the week here, down 10 to 11 for the week here. So during Friday's session, we're in this area here somewhere. So longer term, down here, we look good. Intermediate term, we look a little dicey, but we're still on the positive side of the ledger and the positive side of these lines. And from a shorter term perspective, we have to be aware that the market's dealing with some gaps below. That's kind of a good news, bad news scenario. It's possible that the market will revisit these gaps. That would be the bad news. The good news would be these areas could act as logical areas of potential support. 
If we do a back of the envelope calculation using this S&P 500 39 minute chart, and how is a 39 minute chart helpful? It's like taking a 10 times magnified view of the daily chart of the S&P 500. A 39 minute chart produces 10 bars per day. This is the July high up here where the market peaked earlier in 2023. This is the recent low. Using the same principles, as of Thursday's close, the market had stalled near a logical area. You can see it stalled in here, originally died up here. And if we backtrack, this is an area of potential support if the market chooses to backtrack. Also noteworthy, if you do a back of the envelope calculation from the recent low in October of 2023 to the recent high this week, this move from A to B is approximately 291 points. A typical retracement of 38.250 or 61.8 would give back 111, 146, or 180 of that 291 points from point A to point B. That would hypothetically take us to 4283, very, very close to these anchored volume weighted average price lines here. 4249, very, very close to this level here, or 4214 if we retrace 61.8% of the 291 points. And that still would only take you down into this region here. Moral of the story, if there is weakness, it's easier to be patient if price can hold above this gap area here down at 4245. And from a reference perspective, when this is being recorded on Friday, chart 11.42 a.m. Eastern Time on November 10th, we're trading at 43.75, 43.75. So relative to 43.75, concerns would increase and it's easier to remain patient if we can stay above 42.45 and we're well above that level during the day on Friday. What's the moral of the story on this chart here? It's telling you that the rally attempt has not yet flipped this shorter term or intermediate term downtrend. That starts to become more convincing if we can get out into this area here. As we discussed last week, this is a rally attempt. An impressive one, but still just an attempt. The battle is going to be fought in this area here and potentially down in this region here. This charts after the close on Friday, November 10th. S&P was up 67 points for the session. But in terms of our game plan, we still want to be using a measured approach. Why? We still don't have clear evidence that this downtrend has been broken in any convincing manner. Here's the intraday high here from July of this year. Resistance here in September, right back to that line at today's high. And then we pull back just a little bit before the close. Thus, from a scenario planning perspective and a contingency planning perspective, we have to be ready for a breakout in this direction. And given that we haven't cleared this line or this line or this downward sloping trend line based on those two points, we also have to be open to the market retracing down into these gaps here as we discussed earlier. Not making any assumptions. We've got a game plan on what we'll do if the market backtracks here and holds. A game plan if we don't hold down here, and a game plan if we break out in this direction. We've got a CPI report next week. Probably fair to say we should expect continued indecisiveness and volatility. We still have some excellent reference points below price on the S&P Composite 1500, the broader index. Here's a gap down here in 2022. This was the gap up here in late May, early June of this year. Then we went down here and overshot those regions. And then last week we gapped back above in the exact same area, telling us that this point here, this point here, and this point here remain extremely important from an intermediate term perspective. It's easier to be patient if this low holds, it gets more difficult if price gets into this area here. When we see the market making a stand here, making a stand here, and making a stand here, but in the context of this shorter term downtrend, 
which is yet to be broken. That's just a fact. A logical question to ask and answer is, which way is the market leaning? And under what scenario could we see stocks break to the upside? And under what type of scenario could we see stocks break to the downside? So ratio chart of the NASDAQ composite relative to the S&P 500. If you know your market history, for the most part, it's bullish when the NASDAQ leads the S&P 500. And it tends to be bearish when the NASDAQ lags the S&P 500. That by no means is an all-encompassing statement. It's a general statement about longer-term trends and about rally attempts and bearish rollovers. If we examine this chart with a discernible eye, the ratio was rejected here, and then price undercuts the moving averages. This is a weekly chart. And at this point here, the 50-week moving average in green is on top. So your slowest moving average is on top. Price is rejected. Soon thereafter, we go into a full bore bearish look with blue, the fastest moving average on the bottom. The slopes of all the moving averages are down. Green, the slowest moving average, the 50 week is on top and price is below all the moving averages. Contrast this look here with where we are in the present day. At this point, price makes a stand here and we flip back to a full bore bullish look soon thereafter. See, we're trying to break the downward sloping trend line here. We have not done so in a confident manner, but at this point, and this is during Thursday's session at the close on Thursday, we're back to a full bore bullish look with blue, the fastest moving average on top, green, the slowest moving average on the bottom. The slopes are all up and prices above all of the moving averages. There's no question from a probability perspective, this turn here really doesn't look anything like this bearish turn here. Similar concepts here, this time we have the 10 week, 20 week, and 40 week moving averages. But in this example, we're focusing on price. All things being equal, you'd rather be looking at horizontal lines relative to downward sloping and upward sloping trend lines. Both forms are useful, but experience says horizontal lines are more useful. And you can see as of the close on Thursday on this weekly chart, same ratio, NASDAQ relative to the S&P 500, what once acted as support may now act as resistance, may now act as support, support, potential support. We have the psychological characteristics of a left shoulder, a head, and a right shoulder, and a much improving profile relative to the slope of the green 40-week moving average, telling us to keep an open mind about the NASDAQ resuming leadership relative to this multiple month period of relative consolidation relative to the S&P 500, that is. NASDAQ new highs minus new lows as of the close on Thursday, November 9th. As we mentioned last week, there's really no way to sugarcoat it. Breath data is not appealing. It is concerning and it's something that most likely needs to improve if the market's going to rally in a convincing and sustainable manner. So logically, a chart like this, a concerning chart like this, is at odds with a longer term and very positive chart like this. It's a monthly chart of the NASDAQ dating back to 1978. Entire NASDAQ's history. This is that monthly copic curve that we covered numerous times. Turn up from below zero and eventually cross the zero line. Bottom comes in 1982, 1984, 1991, 2001 in here, 2009, close in 2016, and then 2023. Unequivocally, from a longer term perspective, all of these are excellent entry points when taken in the context of when you recapture the zero line. And in this case, that happens in 2003. We've recaptured the zero line convincingly in 2023. You can see when this happens here in 2003, the worst is over. Good things happen for multiple years. Similar situation here. We cross back. Financial crisis is O-V-E-R. Thus, as noted earlier, if this chart and this signal is accurate from a bullish and historical perspective, it's pretty much inevitable that this chart down here is going to improve. 
Thus, it's logical to ask an answer. If the monthly COPIC signal turns out to be accurate, what could cause market sentiment and market breadth to improve dramatically? Said another way, what could market participants possibly see that would make them have a longer term bullish outlook relative to what's being signaled on this chart here? One extremely logical and possible answer is that inflation improves. Business Insider article this week, inflation is poised to hit the Fed's long-term 2% target by April of next year, according to ING Economics. It's probably fair to say if inflation is back to 2% by April of next year, then this chart is probably 100% on the money and accurate from a historical perspective. And under this scenario here, it's very easy to envision this data here, breath data, improving dramatically. And this chart morphing into a look more like this or this. This is after the major low here in October of 2002 and after the major low in March of 2009. Not a prediction in any shape, form, or fashion, but we know that rents have been coming down. Used car prices have come down a lot. And if inflation gets down to the Fed's 2% target by April of next year, it's also logical to deduce that the Fed is probably done raising interest rates. You can pause your video player here and read a little bit more detail from this article. But of course, you can make an argument that this works both ways, that if inflation does not come down, then this chart up here will have to get in line with this chart down here. Thus, in the rest of the video, let's look at the weight of the evidence, try to discern. Does this chart appear to be on track and this chart will most likely fall in line or is it the other way around? And if you know the calculation of CPI, approximately a third of that calculation is tied to shelter, housing or rent. And the way that it's calculated, we know that even if rents come down, that's going to lag relative to showing up in CPI. And in this article here, they note that rent data from Zillow shows that year-over-year -year growth in observed rent prices have moderated back to pre-pandemic levels. The same official measures of rent in the CPI index should follow the same trend, an improving trend, albeit at a lag. So we have to keep an open mind about inflation coming down, this chart being accurate, and this chart eventually falling in line. At the moment, we've got a mixed bag. This is a fact, and this is a fact. But let's assume it breaks the other way, that this chart in here needs to fall in line with this chart down here. How could that happen? Inflation doesn't come down and we go into a recession. In this scenario here, inflation coming down would tend to align more with a soft landing scenario, especially if inflation gets down to 2% by April of next year. Thus, We'll continue to keep our eye on the most important data sets relative to what's actually used to determine whether or not the U.S. economy is expanding or contracting. And we pulled these data sets on November 9th. They're shown on your screen. Even took the time to click through and look at the charts in larger form. There is nothing on these charts that tells you we are close to these bullet points meshing up with reality at this point. That may change very, very soon, but it's just not showing up in the data. So this data aligns with this scenario of rent and CPI coming down. And at the moment, sides with the longer term chart. And another axiom of technical analysis, longer term charts carry more weight relative to shorter term charts. So let's examine another longer term chart, NASDAQ monthly. These are Bollinger Bands here shown around price. This is the standard relative strength index for the NASDAQ. You can see when RSI tends to undercut 50 and then recapture 50 and make a stand above 50, typically that's a good sign. Happened here in 1988 after the 1987 crash. Happened numerous times after the major low in October of 2002. Occurred in 2004, 2005, slight undercut in 2006. This is during an uptrend between the bottom in October of 2002 and the peak in October of 2007 here. 
Similar situation after the major low in the financial crisis. We come back up, make a stand here, 2010 and 2011, RSI right around 50. You can make an argument that this is similar in the present day. It's also a good sign when we recapture the center line on the Bollinger Band on a monthly chart. None of it predicts anything, but it speaks to odds. All things being equal, monthly RSI above 50 is a good thing. From a negative perspective, as of Thursday's close, daily RSI really hasn't broken out of this cycle here relative to this intermediate term downtrend that we're still in until proven otherwise. So what we'll be looking for, we'd like to see the daily RSI profile morph into something more like this. That may be happening as we speak, but we're not quite there yet. This is a little bit of improvement. This high is higher than this high, but it's not significantly higher than this high in here in September. Really like to see daily RSI get into this area here. Back to a weekly chart. Notice, weekly MACD spent most of 2022 below the zero line. Maybe with the exception of January. It was below the zero line for every other month in 2022. So as we've covered in the past, what does that mean? That means that this is considered to be mathematically a counter trend move within the context of an existing downtrend. Now that starts to flip here in Q1 of 2023 when we recapture the center line. And if MACD gets a bullish cross here above the zero line, this would be considered to be a counter trend move within the context of an existing uptrend. So there's nothing on this MACD chart that says otherwise at this point. Are we more vulnerable? Sure we are. But momentum still above the zero line here and prices above that all-important upward sloping 200-week moving average. And if we look at that 200-week moving average from a longer-term perspective, it's difficult to make the argument that the long-term uptrend from the 2009 low has been broken at this point. This is PPO down here. It's very, very similar to MACD. The math just tends to work a little bit better when you're looking at a long-term chart and you want to compare period A to period B. When PPO recaptured the center line, the dot-com bust bear market was over. When PPO recaptured the center line, the financial crisis bear market was over. At this point, we have recaptured the center line in 2023, looking more vulnerable, but right now we're still above that center line. And it's hard to make an argument that this look in here is radically different from this period in here or this period in here. Same can be said for price. When price recaptured the 200-week moving average, the dot-com bust bear market was over. When price recaptured the 200-week moving average, the financial crisis bear market was over. We have recaptured the upward sloping 200-week. Not unusual to hang around it after a major low. It's a weekly chart of the NASDAQ. Weekly cloud chart. It's as of Thursday's close. Looks even better during Friday's session. This segment of the video is being recorded at 1 p.m. Eastern Time on Friday, November 10th. Currently, the NASDAQ is up 1.55% during Friday's session, even before the 1.55% intraday gain. The weekly NASDAQ, we're looking at the NASDAQ 100 in this case, checking all of the bullish boxes on the weekly cloud. Green above price, yes. Blue above red, yes. Price above red, yes. Price above the cloud, yes. Has the cloud flipped from red to green? Yes. As we've mentioned for several weeks, a more vulnerable look, yes. A confident look in the intermediate term, not yet, but still a bullish look. And what does that say? That says that this most likely, the data that we have in front of us, is a counter trend move within the context of an existing uptrend. This looks quite a bit different relative to this period in here. If this chart morphs into something more like this, this, and this, then concerns would increase. How about if we check in on the ratio of the S&P 500 relative to the price of a 10-year Treasury bond? We've covered this numerous times. You can find a detailed description of these concepts by Googling the title on the bottom of your screen and our last name, Shavako. This article appears 
on seeking alpha. If we were in a situation here where a credit bubble was about to pop, that's a deflationary episode. This is a deflationary look with the ratio, as is this, as is this, as is this. A deflationary event tends to be a recessionary event. So how does the exact same chart look today? Do we have a full bore bearish look as we did in Q4 of the year 2000 with blue the fastest moving average on the bottom, purple the slowest moving average on the top, price below all the moving averages and the slopes of all of them are down? No, we do not. We're much closer to a full bore bullish look as of the close on Thursday, November 9th. And given that during Friday's session around 1 p.m. Eastern time, the 10-year yield was falling and the S&P 500 was rising, it's fair to say at the end of the day when this chart is updated, it will most likely move in the market's favor again. It really doesn't align with the major credit crisis and imminent recession theory. The long-term chart of the S&P 500 aligns with those long-term and positive looks on the NASDAQ and the NASDAQ 100. It's a monthly chart as of Thursday's close with the 10-week and the 40-week that we've covered numerous times in these videos. Historically, this is a constructive look. It's not a concerning look. And as of Thursday's close, all of this downtrend here, this shorter-term or intermediate-term downtrend since the high near the end of July 2023, all of it has occurred above the cloud. Prices recaptured the weekly pivot here at 42.50. During Friday's session, the S&P 500 was trading at 43.95-ish. If we zoom in on this look over here, again, as of Thursday's close, it's difficult to make the argument that this is a concerning look from a longer term perspective. It's an improving look. Prices recaptured both of the moving averages and we're back to a full bore bullish look. Keep in mind, this is a shorter term chart. It's a daily chart. All things being equal, monthly charts tend to be more important. Longer time frames. Same concepts here. Price above an upward sloping 50 month moving average in blue. That's what a secular bull market looks like. This is 1982 to the year 2000, which looks significantly different from this secular period of stagnation here between the peak in 2000 all the way out to this point here in 2013. From that point forward, this starts to look a lot like this. And you can look at these periods back here they're constructive periods. They're after bad things have happened when you get a look like this and then recapture the zero line with the monthly copper curve and the S&P 500. This look here and this improving long-term momentum down here aligns with a scenario that says inflation most likely is going to improve in the next six to 10 months. It's a zoomed in look as of Thursday's close with that improving look. We make a stand at that all important upward sloping 200 week. Secular bull markets tend to make a stand at or near an upward sloping 200 week moving average. And thus far, this decline has all occurred above an upward sloping 200 week moving average, telling us that we should continue to give the long term uptrend the benefit of the doubt until proven otherwise. Is it possible? that yields could take a break in this area. Yes, it's possible. Having said that, the long-term trend in interest rates has flipped. And as we've talked about numerous times, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a showstopper for a secular bull market. Go back and look at interest rates from 1950 to 1968. They were rising, they rose dramatically, and the stock market did quite well. So even if the bias is for higher inflation longer term and higher interest rates, there's always counter trend moves, meaning it's possible that interest rates are going to take a little bit of a break. And it's possible, even if the longer term trend for inflation is higher, that it also takes a break. How about the VIX? Never reached the levels that we talked about in this October 10th, 2023 post here. You can find it by Googling the title on your screen and our last name, Shavako. If the VIX got up between 26 and 31-ish, concerns would increase. That did not happen. This is the weekly chart. This is dated November 1st. This is dated November 9th. On November 9th, the VIX was trading at 1529-ish. 
And during Friday's session, it was trading at 14.44. This really doesn't look anything like 31 down here. And after this level was hit in the historical cases, the market fell an additional 20% roughly. This number was hit when the market was down approximately 8%. The total drawdown was somewhere in the neighborhood on average between 27 and 28%. Amex listed financial stocks think smaller cap financials made a stand here in 2008-2009, made a stand in a very, very similar area in 2020, trying to make a stand in a similar area in 2023. Global stocks trying to make a stand above an upward sloping 200 week moving average and in the context of a rising 200 day moving average. An important tech stock, an important stock for the market in general, Amazon Weekly Cloud, much improved, checking all of the bullish boxes as of Thursday's close. Interest rates had a look that told us to keep an open mind to the possibility of a counter trend move, meaning interest rates could come down. Very similar concepts here relative to TLT. It's near areas of possible support from a long-term perspective. This chart is as of the close on Thursday, November 9th. Earlier in 2023, Apple, another very important stock, recaptured the 200-day moving average here in Q1. Correction coming back to an upward sloping 200-day, and thus far as of Thursday's close, making a stand. And if you compared the shorter-term chart for Apple as of Thursday's close, that 39-minute chart, it looks better than the chart for SPY or the S&P 500. We've cleared a, a lot more of these levels in a more convincing manner. And if it decides to backtrack, this would be an area of possible support between 177.60-ish and let's call it 175.50-ish. Pause your video player here. Constructive look near the October low in 2022. You can make an argument the ratio has a similar look in October of 2023. High yield bonds relative to IEI three to seven year treasuries. This is an I'm concerned about the economy look here between mid 2014 and the bottom here in early 2016 S&P 500 bottoms here. So this is risk off. We're concerned about the economy. We're concerned about the probability of rising bond defaults little bit more pronounced here during the COVID plunge. This is the look of the same ratio since October of last year. Not screaming imminent crisis. All of that taking place above an upward sloping 200 week moving average in red. If we're looking for a chart that helps us keep an open mind about worse than expected outcomes, as of Thursday's close, IEF not particularly impressive and this speaks to interest rates. Cover this chart in the past. IGV in the ETF world expanded tech software sector. When you get this look here on the weekly chart, this is the 40 week in blue, the 200 week in red. When you get this look here, it's after the major low. The bear market is over. When you get this look here, it's after the major low. The financial crisis is over. Hard to make an argument that this is not similar to this point here in this point here. And from 2004, the S&P 500 didn't peak in terms of a major peak again until several years later in October of 2007. And from 2010, you can make an argument we don't have a major peak until Q4 2021 on this chart and in the S&P 500 early 2022. Simply telling us to keep an open mind about the October low being the low and keeping an open mind about better than expected outcomes. Speaks to composition. QQQ is the tech heavy NASDAQ. IYW, all tech. Here's the risk off look here. This is Q1 2022. You can see the ratio morphs into a full bore bearish look. Walking forward from this low here in Q4 of 2022, we morph back into a full bore bullish look. This is as of Thursday's close. On November 9th, the market was down on Thursday. The ratio looked healthy on Thursday. 
If you pause your video player here, the profile, the weekly cloud of JNK high yield bonds looks similar to the period after the major low in 2009 and after the major low in 2016. You can pause your video player here. Corporate bonds, higher risk and higher yielding corporate bonds, LQD, relative to lower risk and lower yielding IEF. If we look at two of the more extreme cases, 2007 here, Q4 of 2008 here, this is a risk off look. The S&P 500 is not performing well in here with the ratio below a downward sloping 30 week moving average. Contrast this look here with this period here after the major low in Q1 of 2016 and into January of 2018. The S&P 500 is doing extremely well in this period here, especially during calendar year 2017. This really doesn't look anything like this. It's fair to say thus far the present day looks more like this period here. In this move since the October low of last year, this really doesn't look a lot like this. October 31st tweet mentioning a potentially constructive setup in Microsoft. This tweet also referenced a March 14th tweet that turned out to be helpful that also referenced potentially positive setups in Apple and Microsoft. This is a slide that we covered last week. This is dated November 1st here. If we look at Microsoft this week. This is a weekly chart, the large chart as of Thursday's close. Price action well above an upward sloping 200 week moving average. Nothing here that's telling us that the long term trend is in jeopardy. If we look at weekly MACD down here in the lower right hand corner. We're getting a bullish weekly cross telling us that this weakness considered to be a counter trend move within the context of existing uptrend. And if this holds into the close on Friday, this is as of Thursday's close, then MACD would be telling us we have improved odds relative to this pullback that started in late July, this pullback being over. This is increasing fear here during a down leg 2015-2016. Increasing fear here, Q4 of 2018 was not a pleasant experience. The market bottomed on Christmas Eve 2018. Increasing fear look here during COVID. Increasing fear look last year. This is the look of the exact same chart during the recent correction. This doesn't look anything like this and this really doesn't look anything like the other orange boxes. This chart too as of Thursday's close. This look here from Q4 2021 till October of 2022 speaks to concerns about Fed policy, interest rates, and the economy. This contrasting look walking forward from October of 2022 speaks to the same topics. This looks a lot better than this. Similar situation here, present day chart here. This looks a lot better than this in 2007-2008. And the present day over here on the right looks a lot more like the period after the major low in here and into 2017 where we said earlier the market did extremely well. As of Thursday's close, not taking on a confident risk off look on this chart as it was here and here. Financial sector hanging in there. Thursday's close above the 200 week here covering this chart for a long time, including a tweet on May 7th. XLK relative to IEF says a lot about expectations about those important topics. Fed policy, interest rates, the economy, inflation expectations, all baked into the cake here in 2022 with the risk off look. Notice the ratio starts to improve when the S&P 500 bottoms in Q4 of 2022 in October. Since then, a much improved look. Present day look looks a lot more like 2021 over here when the S&P 500 was still rising and really doesn't look anything like 2022. 
consolidation in this ratio begins somewhere in here. Let's call it August of 2020. If we look at the 200-day moving average in red, the 50-day moving average in blue, and the ratio relative to those moving averages, it is possible after a long battle between tech and the S&P 500 that tech is resuming its longer-term trend of leadership. Remember we said Thursday's session on a daily chart was not particularly appealing. The S&P 500 and risk assets in general had a tough day on November 9th, daily cloud chart. You can see XLK was down almost a half a percent here. That would be the bad news. The good news would be there are a lot of things improving on this daily cloud chart as of the close on Thursday, November 9th. You can see it here barely. Daily cloud turned green for the first time since August 17th. That's a constructive look. Blue above red, price above red, green span above price, price above the cloud, checking the fifth box as of yesterday's close, cloud flipping from red to green. Speaks to improving probabilities on a daily time frame. Present day over here, if you pause your video player, really doesn't look like this increasing fear look with price above an upward sloping long-term moving average. S&P 500 peaks right here in October of 2007. This doesn't really look like the risk off periods highlighted with the orange boxes on your screen. This is not a confidence inspiring look, but it's not really a concerning look either. All of this consolidation in the ratio has taken place above this important breakout level that occurred here in late May, early June of this year, and above the 225 day moving average in black, and above the 250 day here on the bottom of the stack. Similar concepts is a weekly time frame defensive staples relative to the S&P 500. Dropping below, this is after the major low in 2016. You drop below before that nice run in 2017. Drop below here after the COVID low. We recently have been battling in that area, but right now, during this entire pullback, this really hasn't taken on a high fear look as it did here and here. There are numerous things to be concerned about in the present day. But we also have a lot of evidence that tells us to keep an open mind about better than expected outcomes and this chart here potentially falling in line with this chart here. If we take this first bullet point here, inflation is poised to hit the Fed's long-term 2% target by April of next year, according to ING Economics. Of course, that's a forecast and that's a hypothetical, but it's based on data that we already have in hand and trends that we have in hand. If this is true and this is true, hard to make an argument that the long-term trends that we've shown in that context contradict anything in this post here that you can find on our website by Googling the title and our last name. Doesn't seem to contradict any of this. And everything that we've talked about from a longer term perspective also aligns with the secular shift in interest rates we talked about on June 23rd. Also noteworthy, it's hard to make the argument that the recent pullback is occurring within the context of a bear market. Prior to the pullback, we could check all of these boxes. During Friday's session, S&P above the 200-day, yes. Slope of the 200-day up, yes. Is the 20-week above the 30-week above the 40-week on the weekly chart of the S&P, yes. Is the slope of the 50-week moving average up, it is. It's the slope of the 200-week moving average up. It is. It's price above the 200-week. It is. It's price above the 50-month. It is. Slope of the 50-month up. It is. This says unequivocally that given what we know today, the long-term trend is up. That may change, and it may change very, very soon, but it hasn't changed yet. And sometimes it can be important to hear similar messages from different sources. Article dated November 10th. Business Insider, bullet point number one. The US economy has defied most analyst predictions this year with growth staying strong. That could set the stage for the roaring 20s decade, according to UPS. Higher growth, higher inflation, and higher interest rates could come to define the period. All of this 
seems to align extremely well with all of this, including the shift in interest rates and inflation. To summarize, we know the market recently made a stand at an extremely important level, and it did so within the context of existing long-term uptrends and in the context of a still strong U.S. economy. And given that as of Friday's close, we could check all of the boxes again in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, it's prudent to treat the current correction as a counter-trend move within the context of an existing and ongoing and still healthy long-term uptrend. And if we're going to handle the scenarios that we outlined Earlier in this video using this chart, we all know the only way that we can do that effectively is if we head into next week and every week with that flexible, unbiased, and open mind. The material in this video has no regard to the specific investment objectives, financial situation, or particular needs of any viewer. This video is presented solely for informational purposes and is not to be construed as a solicitation or an offer to buy or sell any securities or any related financial instruments, nor should any of its content be taken as investment advice. Any opinions expressed in this video are subject to change without notice, and Shivaco Capital Management, LLC, or CCM, is not under any obligation to update or keep current the information contained herein. CCM and its respective officers and associates, or clients, may have an interest in the securities or derivatives of any entities referred to in this material. CCM accepts no liability whatsoever for any loss or damage of any kind arising out of the use of all or any part of this material. We recommend that you consult with a licensed and qualified professional before making any investment decision.